This video is going to kick off our MSK block. So MSK stands for musculoskeletal. So we'll be talking about the muscles and we'll also be talking about the skeletal system. So your skeletal system is made up of your skeleton. Your skeleton is this giant scaffolding that's made out of bones and it does a ton of things. It's not only there for support, it's not only there for your muscles to attach and cause you to, you know, allow you to move locomotion, but it also creates cells, participates in hematopoiesis. It stores minerals, stores fat. So your bones do a lot of things. Now, how do you make bone in the first place? So let's talk about making bone. Let's go over some basics. Now to develop bone, you're gonna need two types of cells. You're gonna need a cell that makes bone. You're gonna need a cell that breaks down bone. A cell that makes bone is called your osteoblast. So all right, makes bone. And then your osteoclast will dissolve bone. Sometimes called resorb. Class means to break down. So just keep these two in the back of your mind. So during embryological and even development into your early childhood, you're making bone. Most of your skeleton first starts with a cartilage blueprint. A blueprint made out of cartilage. Now, do you remember the cell that makes cartilage? You say chondrocytes, you're absolutely right. So chondrocytes makes this kind of cartilage blueprint. Your osteoblast and your osteoclast will see that, say, cool, I can work with that. Go into that cartilage blueprint and then start making bone. Start weaving in bone. We call that woven bone. That bone's not as strong, it's kind of shaky. So eventually we keep weaving and keep weaving and keep weaving until we have a solid sheet. And we eventually turn that into lamellar bone. Lamellar means sheet. So we turn that, that weave of bone into a solid sheet and then we have our bone. We call this process endochondral ossification. Ossification means making bone. Endo in chondral cartilage, making bone inside of cartilage. So we had our cartilage blueprint, our osteoblast and our osteoclast came in, made our woven bone and then finally made it into a plate, into proper bone. I just want to talk about it in a little bit more detail. We kind of talked about it rather quickly. So we have our cartilage blueprint. Commonly, you'll start making bone in one spot. We call that your primary ossification center, your primary bone making center. Your osteoblast will make your bone. So we say, what do your osteoclasts do? Why are they, these are things that dissolve bone. Why is it in this process? Well, your osteoclast will start to dissolve bone in the middle and form that cavity. Remember your bone is kind of porous in the middle because that's where all the bone marrow and all the hematopoiesis takes place. So that's why your osteoclast is important. It makes that little cavity in the middle. And then it's also like your eraser. If you make a mistake, your osteoclast can kind of come in and erase that, that mistake. So it does that. Now at the same time, other sites of ossification occur. So your osteoblast will go into these sites also and make bone. We call those secondary ossification centers. And eventually, and eventually they'll grow and meet with each other and that cartilage blueprint will have become your bone. All but probably the end. The end will still be cartilage. It just kind of cushions the bottom of your bone, kind of wraps around your bone at the end. So at the end, you'll still have a little bit of cartilage left. So that's endochondrial ossification. That's what happens to most of your skeleton. However, um, certain parts of your body, like your flat bones of your, your skull, uh, the facial bones, your jaw, your clavicle, don't go through this process. So, all right, flat bones of face, skull, clavicle, doesn't use this process, doesn't need a cartilage blueprint. It can just make bone right off the bat. So the osteoclast just comes together, forms a sheet, and just makes bone. So I'll just write, makes bones. And it's the same process, woven bone first, starts making those weave until it's finally one solid plate. Lamellar. So woven to lamellar is kind of like the, the progression of how you make bone, even when you break a bone. When you break a bone, you have to make new bone to kind of cover it up. It will go from woven to lamellar. That's how you make your bone. Now I just want to do a little side note on cartilage. We're 
Call what makes cartilage? The beer chondrocytes. Uh, cartilage is avascular, meaning it doesn't have blood vessels. The only way it gets nutrients is through diffusion from somewhere else, somewhere nearby. And so if you damage your cartilage, it takes a long time to heal. That's it, avascular. It's made up of collagen and also proteins that have um, a glucose group on it. So we call those proteoglycans, as in like proteoglucose, proteoglycans. Proteoglycans. And the ratio of collagen and proteoglycans changes its characteristic. And so you can have different types of cartilage depending on the ratio. So you can have a type called hyalin. Now hyalin cartilage is seen in your joints. You have a type called elastic, which is elastic. So there's a cartilage that you can see in your epiglottis, you can see in your ear. Gives you that elastic feel. It's all right, ear. And then lastly, you can have fibro cartilage. And this is both flexible and strong. It's actually one of the strongest, if not the strongest form of cartilage. How does it get that, that kind of best of both worlds? Well, most cartilage is made up of type two collagen. But this lucky dog is made up of type one. All right, and it's seen in a lot of places, but one that is commonly asked is it's seen in your intervertebral disc. So between your spinal disc. Intervertebral, I'm not, I don't know what I'm trying to spell here. Inner vertebral disc. Just a little side note on cartilage. Cartilage, let's go back to bone, all right? So going back to bone. We've made our bone. And now we have our adult bone. Something you should know, there's uh, two types of bone. The outside, really strong, really tough bone, usually what we think of when we're thinking of bone, that's your cortical bone. But inside is a little bit more spongy, a little bit more porous, a little bit more spacious. We call that your spongy bone or your trabecular bone. Your trabecular bone is where most of the hematopoiesis takes place, so it's more metabolically active. Comprende, that is bone development. Now, we kind of glossed over osteoblast and osteoclast kind of quickly. We said osteoblast makes bone, osteoclast dissolves bone. Let's talk about it in a little bit more detail because it is very important you know how. Osteoblast makes bone by producing collagen and matrix that eventually will mold and form bone. Loves to work in an alkali, alkalinized environment, so a high pH environment, and can catalyze this, this kind of mineralization and, and bone formation by producing enzymes, especially ALP. ALP stands for alkalinized, alkalinized, <laughs> ALP stands for alkalinized phosphatase. The enzyme that takes phosphate groups off, especially in an alkaline environment, so perfect for this um, job. So it produces collagen, produces this environment, and produces enzymes that work in this environment and makes bone. Why is it called an osteoblast? If you remember from my heme blog, blast means immature cells. What does that mean? Well, osteoblast is an immature cell, produces bone, and then will eventually settle into that bone, settle into bone, and mature. And when it matures, it finally gets the title of osteocyte or bone cell. That's why it's called an osteoblast. It's just an immature cell. It still functions, but then once it goes into a bone, it will mature and become an osteocyte. Now, osteoclast breaks down bone. It's like the moral enemy of osteoblast. And whatever osteoblast does, osteoclast will do the opposite because it needs to break down bone. So, whereas osteoblast make collagen, osteoclast will make collagenase. Whereas osteoblast worked in a high pH environment, Osteoclast works in a low pH environment, so it will secrete H+, and that H+, like acid, like any acid, will just dissolve things. It will dissolve your bones. If you leave a tooth in an acid, it will dissolve that too, so that's how it dissolves bone. One thing you should know, osteoblast comes from your stem cells, your mesenchymal stem cells, and your periosteum. Your periosteum is just this tough connective tissue layer that has these stem cells makes those stem cells 
makes those osteoblasts and that osteoblast will create your bone and then your periosteum will eventually cover that bone. Osteoclast comes from monocyte and macrophage precursors. You know that macrophages can become giant cells they fuse together and become multinuclear cells. Well, osteoclasts are no different. They become these giant multinuclear cells and you need to be able to distinguish them on imaging. I have a picture in my notes, know it well, because they look very different. They, they look very unique also, so they can just show you a big giant osteoclast, not say what it is, and you should be able to say, oh, it makes collagenase, makes H+, resorbs bone, etc., etc. It's from a monocyte macrophage precursor. Blurred out all those facts just from seeing that image. Is there anything else I want to talk about this? No, I think that is it. Now, how do we control the balance of the two? We don't want too much bone making. We don't want too little. We don't want too much bone resorption. We don't want too little. So we need to control it somehow. And we found out that your osteoblasts are actually your main source of control. Or your osteoblast actually controls your osteoclast most of the time. How does it do that? Well, your osteoblast, this will be your osteoblast. This will be an immature osteoclast. Your osteoblast controls your osteoclast by producing a protein called rank L. Now rank L is also known as rank ligand. It goes by, um, also goes by a scientific name. Sometimes they call it by that scientific name. I have it down in my notes if you want to know what it is. It's receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B ligand. Quite, quite a name for them. Sometimes they call it that. That just means rank L, okay? So don't get confused. So rank L or rank ligand is a protein and will bind to rank receptor on the osteoclast. And when it binds to it, it'll differentiate and make your mature osteoclast. So that is how your osteoblast makes osteoclast and controls and activates it. Now we don't want too much osteoclast activity. We don't want too much bone resorption. So to balance the rank L, we also make a decoy protein called O P. G, called osteoprotecrin, and, and osteoprotecrin will bind rank L, kind of take it out of commission, and that way it never binds to your osteoclast, never creates differentiation. So they balance each other that way. Let's say you want low osteoclast activity. What does that mean? Well, that would mean you want low rank L, right? And that's what differentiates osteoclast and high OPG to kind of act as a decoy protein grab up any rank L there is let's say you want high osteoclast activity how do your body control that well your osteoblast will create more rank L and less OPG that's just how your body controls these levels keeps it in balance now there are other things that can affect your osteoblast and osteoclast and affect this balance one of them is estrogen estrogen builds bone builds bone. It does this by causing apoptosis of your osteoclast, so it kind of lowers bone resorption. Also, lowers rank L, so lowers osteoclast that way. This is why postmenopausal women are at risk of osteoporosis. When their estrogen drops, then they no longer have this inhibition. Rank L will rise. Osteoclast will no longer apoptose, and then you'll have more and more bone resorption, and you have osteoporosis. Next up is PTH, is a hormone produced by a parathyroid called parathyroid hormone. Before we talk about parathyroid hormone, just remember that your bone is a kind of reserve for minerals, especially calcium. All right, so just keep that in mind. Parathyroid hormone at low levels builds bone. You need to know that most people, when they associate PTH was something they associated with breaking down bone. That's not true. P PTH at low normal levels build bone. If you take a teenager who's building bone like crazy because they're teenagers and you take their blood, they're going to have PTH in it. That's evidence enough that it builds bone. They're not, you know, having bone resorption. So low normal levels build bone. However, if you have um, low calcium in your serum, so I'll say low calcium,
your body will detect that and release PTH at a higher level. High PTH breaks down bone. Why on earth would you want to break down bone? When you break down bone, you break that mineral reserve and you release calcium in your blood and you kind of alleviate this, alleviate that low calcium. So when you have low calcium, your body freaks out, says I need to break down this bone, kind of release calcium back into my blood, I'll release a ton of PTH. So PTH at high levels breaks down bone. How does it do that? Does it work on the osteoclast? No. What controls your osteoclast would be your osteoblast. So it actually works on your osteoblast and tells it to increase osteoclast activity. The only hormone I can think of that can really work on your osteoclast would be calcitonin. So calcitonin is a hormone made in your thyroid. If you have, when you have low calcium, you'll make high PTH. When you have too much calcium, you'll try and want to lower that calcium, right? So calcitonin does that. Calcitonin lowers calcium. So it kind of works against PTH. And that works directly on your osteoclast, inhibits your osteoclast directly, tells it to you know, stop breaking down bone. Okay, so that's bone basics. I just want to go over the bone foundation and hopefully when we talk about bone pathology next, it won't be too confusing. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.